serve, a heart to do good in our communities, and we would read your word daily, that you would encourage us to read your word daily, that you would remind us who you really are and how much you really love us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Good morning, everybody. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, please? Matthew 18. If you indulge me for a moment, I'd like to share something with you. I, uh, uh, like many people in our church and in our community, caught the stomach flu last week. It was not a fun week. I'm a day removed from the nasty stuff. But my wife saw me getting sick, and she's still not getting close to me, so that's why I'm not getting close to you all, all right? So if I seem standoffish, it's not because I don't care. It's because I, I do care. I um, need you to get to Matthew 18, and we're going to continue where we left off last week. Um, I've been working in this series called Identifying Jesus, Today's Kingdom Relationships, Part 2. We opened Matthew 18 last week. I'm going to read the first four verses. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child 
is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Without repeating a bunch of the message from last week, let me just say that Matthew makes a transition here from talking primarily about humility before God to love towards neighbor. Humility is the source of a right relationship with God, and it's a source of a right relationship with others. So coming out of verse 4 into our passage today, verses 5 to 14, Jesus makes the same transition. If you've got your sermon outlines, you'll see in verses 5 through 9, our Lord teaches them and us about our actions towards what he calls the little ones. And in verses 10 to 14, about our attitude towards what he calls the little ones. First, number one on your sermon outlines, we have our action towards these. Pick up in verse 5, please. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 7. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Our actions towards the little ones. Pretty graphic here, okay? We're using little ones instead of children because Jesus himself makes this this shift in usage between verses 5 to 6. He starts in verse 5. And whoever calls one such child in my name welcomes me. And then continues, verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble. And he only uses the terms little ones from that point on. Now, we could just say it's a parallel, okay, that a child equals the same thing as little one. And that even seems to be the case in verses 5 to 6. But what follows in verses 7 to 14, we learned it. Jesus subtly shifts from talking about literal children to certain children of God, those he labels little ones. Now, with this usage, Jesus could mean everyone in the kingdom of heaven, regardless of age, or he could mean, as I think he means, the least of these, my brothers. As he phrases it in Matthew 25, 40, you remember, the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of these One of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine you did for me. That is, little ones are those Christians who are most often marginalized or whom we'd be tempted to look down on because of lack of wealth or status or health or giftedness or spiritual maturity. They're the ones with little resources, little social standing, perhaps even little faith, such as the weaker brothers of Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. They are those who are prone to wander, like we see a little bit later in Matthew 18, verse 12. So then, to the point this morning, regarding these little ones within the church, Jesus calls his, his church, especially the more mature, or shall we say less little, he calls us to action. And the primary action to which we are called here is not only to, verse 5, receive, you know, it's kind of like open a door and welcome these little ones in his name into our fellowship because Christ receives such as to his fellowship, but we are to protect them as well once they're in. And it's at this point that Jesus uses a couple couple graphic images to, to wake us up, you know, to make sure that we catch this. Also make sure, folks, that you get this distinction. These are warnings for believers, not for unbelievers. If we ever get to thinking that our little sins are not a big deal to Christ and his church, Christ is saying something else about it. The two judgment images here involve fire and water. First, imagine being thrown into a pit that's on fire continuously or 
Secondly, having a giant millstone, a two-ton slab of circular stone so huge and heavy that it needs a donkey to move it, fastened around your neck, and then while wearing this concrete collar, you're taken out to the middle of the sea and left you, left on your own, and down you go, and go, and go. Milton called it the dark eternal grave or the black Gehenna in his classic work, Paradise Lost. Douglas O'Donnell writes, Christian, your personal holiness matters. Look at verses 8 and 9, please. Look at that whole, the, that, that whole business about cutting off and gouging out stuff. Christian, your personal holiness matters. What we do privately with our hand, our foot, our eye actually can affect other believers. That's what Jesus is teaching here. How you see things, the eye, affects how others see. What you do, the hand, affects what others will do. And how you walk, the foot, affect how others will walk. You see, what we do to guard ourselves is also a means of guarding or protecting others around us, especially the little ones. Now, Jesus used the same kind of very hard graphic language earlier in a Sermon on the Mount concerning sexual sin, but here it's expanded to every realm that could cause another to stumble. So, Christian, I need to ask, do you rush to judgment? Do you easily lose your temper? Do you gossip? Do you discount those considered unimportant? Do you think of yourself as so important? And how about that whole list of things that many would consider matters of conscience that often vary through the ages? Drinking, matter of dress or style, length of hair, tattoos or piercings, going to the movies or what movies you choose to go to, playing cards, playing Dungeon and Dragons. How long could the list be if we wanted to keep adding to it? I invite you to turn to this week's study questions or just spend some real time in passages such as Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 if you want to see about what Scripture says about all of this, like where your rights extend and what about the other person causing them to stumble, that kind of thing. But this morning, I just want you to focus in on what Jesus is saying about others. If we're talking about just you, into verse 9, it's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Sin is serious stuff for you. But the woe is the man warning here is not directed towards your actions towards yourself, but to others. Look again at verse 7. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. The New Living Translation has it this way. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. Sin is serious business all the time, but when your sin endangers or influences the lives of the little, little ones, God would say to us, this is real serious stuff, so church, take it seriously. It's also take seriously verses 10 to 14, where our Lord transitions from teaching about our actions towards the little ones to our attitude toward them, verses 10 to 14. See that. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than, than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Look again at the beginning of verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these 
little ones. Here's our attitude check. New Living Translation has, beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. Now remember, we're not only talking about, or even primarily talking about literal little children at this point. We're talking about what the world sees as the least of these, the ones other people walk by that don't make eye contact with. Put yourself between them and your, and your little kids. In my, in my mind's eye, I automatically see the beggars, often diseased and maimed on the public streets and buses when my family was in Brazil. But it doesn't need to be that severe, right? What so often separates us here in our country, even in our churches, We've already mentioned a lack of wealth, status, health, giftedness, spiritual maturity. Can we put in race, education, marital status, age, maybe even in today's climate, political beliefs? Jesus say, says, see that you do not despise or look down on one of these Little ones. So let's turn it around. Why should we value them? And to that question, Jesus gives one answer. They matter much to God. And he gives two illustrations. The first illustration is about their angels. And I don't want to get in a prolonged discussion about whether each child, little one, or individual has their own guardian angel or angels. It Seems that they possibly do. Hebrews 1.14 are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. That's not the point here. The point is, if these beings, angels, who serve the little ones, they are their angels. If these beings are in heaven, and that's a pretty important place to be, and they're looking directly upon God... Seems like they have a pretty high order. Here we go. How much more valuable are the little ones they serve and protect? Does that make sense? If, if, the, if your bodyguards that are assigned to you are from the secret service, all right, you're somebody. And if your angel stands continually before the face of God, your stock has risen many fold. See that you do not despise or look down on one of these little ones. Why should we value them? Because God himself values these same ones. Second illustration of this divine value is the parable of the lost sheep. Here our Lord says, verse 12, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one? You ought to go back and count how many times he uses that designation of one or ones just in this short passage. It's a, it's a whole bunch. And go look for the one that wandered off. And if he finds it truly, I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now, many of you will recognize that this parable is very much like the one found in Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. But the context is very different. There, in Luke 15, it forms one of three stories which show how much the Son of Man is willing to undertake in order to bring lost people and lost coins and lost sheep back to himself. The purpose there in Luke 15 is evangelistic, saving the lost, but the, the purpose here is it's pastoral, it's care. Jesus is talking to his disciples, those who are later to become leaders in the church. He's been telling them not to put stumbling blocks in the way of the apparently unimportant and to be, a writer by the name of Michael Green put it, and to be utterly ruthless with sinful tendencies in themselves because of how it affects others. And now Jesus encourages them to care for the lonely, the lost, the sick, the discouraged, the, the sheep without a shepherd, and God cares enormously for each one. 
Again, count how many times in our passage today he mentions one. And isn't it something that God Almighty would value, be mindful as one such as you or me to that degree? And remember that all of this, it's, it's leading to Jerusalem and the cross that Jesus bore for each of us. Recognize, don't, don't miss that even the statistically unimportant, one out of a hundred, what is that? Even that one is important to me. One matters. You matter. So much to the Father that he sends out the shepherd, Jesus himself, on the ultimate search and rescue mission. It's only in that context that we understand, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Jesus is, is talking about our attitude in the face of those whom God both, val both values and loves. Matthew Henry summarizes it by saying, let not earth despise those whom heaven respects. We could simply say in humility we're to value each and every little one as God does. That's the primary point of the parable and of the passage. Verses 1 to 4, we went through last week. It's, it starts with humility before God. And that leads to the love of the least in attitude and action, verses 5 to 14. When we open up Matthew chapter 18 and ask, what is Jesus teaching us here? Because it, it goes all over, and some of it's pretty graphic. I think we find that humility is the source of both the right relationship with God and with others. And to bring this down and make it as, as actionable as I know how, I think what Jesus is saying that this relationship that's this way, it has to affect, transform our relationships that are this way. And if this isn't being changed, we better go back and check our relationship this way. It starts with humility before God, our need of him. And once we understand his love towards us, it's to transform, it's to change, it's to affect our relationships this way, even to the least of these, because God values that one as much as he loves you and me. Would you pray with me, please? Father, basic message, but one that you repeat again and again and again, because you know that we can, we can lose sight, we get caught up in ourselves and in our stuff and lose sight of you and your mission, your goal, your purpose in Jesus. May our hearts expand towards you in such a way that they enlarge towards others as well. May your love for them, whoever that might be, Lord, direct our actions and attitudes. Please, Lord, have us, help us to have first the humility before you that allows you to use us in reaching out, guarding, protecting, winning, helping them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's our song? Be thou my vision. Would you stand with me, please? We'd like to have a couple prayer partners come forward. If you'd like to pray about your own walk, your relationship with him first, or maybe another, 
would invite you to come forward as we sing, Be Thou My Vision, this idea that we've set him before him, and he's the one that's leading us through this. come to the part of our service where we get to celebrate together a reminder, uh, a remembrance, if you will. Um, Jesus brought to the, his disciples to this upper room to have this meal together. Now, this was a common practice. Every year, they'd practice this Passover meal together, right? It was a remembrance of an event in the past that helped root them in their, their history, their traditions, right? Reminding them of Egypt, reminding them of all of this past, all of this history that them as a community, them as a family have gone through and experienced together. And they use it as a teaching tool for the following generations. What better way for our Lord to, to, to reteach not only about himself, but reteach and set a new precedence as a family, as a community of of believers is, is a remembrance, is a reminder, as a setting a new trajectory, if you will. We have all these, we read the Bible and we have all these, these stories and just like Rick taught today, sometimes they're not all about us, it's about the others, it's about how we fit together. And so we, we have this opportunity to come together to take these emblems and to remember not only who Jesus is, but also uniting the body in one in one vision and one one purpose and one mission, if you will. Um, 
if you pray with me and these guys can start passing the cups and we'll pray over our, over our, our communion table together. Lord, we just thank you so much for who you are. This table, this opportunity to be able to to remember who you are, to remember your love, to remember your grace and remember your mercy. But to remember also that you're calling us to a much bigger vision than just ourselves. A much bigger mission to, to love others and to share that grace and that mercy with others as well. Lord, thank you so much for your heart. And it's in your name we pray these things. We now get to come to the part where we get to uh, talk a little bit about tithes and offerings. Um, in chewing on this passage this week about um, Rick's passage this last couple weeks about um, having a childlike faith, uh, I look at my kids and I saw Dylan this morning and he had some paper sticking out of his back pocket and I'm like, Dylan, you got you got paper sticking out of your pocket? What do you got? What do you got there? He smiled. I don't know what to tell him. I said, yeah, it's like a piece of paper sticking out of your pocket. He said, oh, it's my tithes and offerings. And he pulled out a, cu you know, a couple dollar bills. Kids have a propensity and a capacity to give, and they don't care. <laughs> they just give, right? They just give. They like giving. They like being a part of something bigger than themselves. They like participating in what the big people are doing give because they don't have a they don't have a care they don't have a worry right and sometimes i think with our giving and our 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 over concern for finances and do i have it in the budget can i make sure to to pay the bills and we get all these things worried about monies and sometimes we forget just being a part of the giving and part of the bigger picture of what god's got going on being a being a part of what the big guy's doing it's fun joyful would you pray with me lord we ask your blessing on the plates being passed today we ask your blessing on the on the on the giver and their hearts uh, as they choose to to give to your bigger mission they're not just giving to fifth avenue but they're giving to you they're giving to your bigger vision your bigger mission they want to be a part of what you have going on lord we ask that you bless these plates today and 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 bless the wisdom of the decision makers who are are, are using those resources uh, with your wisdom and with your vision and your, your sight in mind. We thank you so much, Father, for being uh, the owner of everything. We want to be able to give back and be able to be a part of what you have going on. Thank you, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lynette Stortz, and I'm one of the co-directors of our Vacation Bible School program. Uh, Stephanie Ford and Jessica McLean are the other directors. Um, this year's theme, as you saw, is the Great Jungle Journey. Um, but like it said at the end there, we can't do it without your help. So we are at this time um, talking about volunteers. Um, we will open up student registration in about a month or so, but right now we need to get our volunteers in place. So there are a couple different ways that you can sign up to help with Vacation Bible School. It is June 10th to the 14th, Monday through Friday, runs from 8 in the morning till 12.15. We'd love to have you help. If you work during the day and you can't be here, but you could help us do some things ahead of time, or you could come on Sunday and decorate, we'd love to have you help. Uh, back at the check-in desk, Harvey is out there, and there are some cards. I know Matt showed these to you last week as well. It has a QR code on it. You can scan the QR code, um, and it will take you to Answers in Genesis um, website, and you can sign up to volunteer there. I know last week there was a little bit of issue. It's on Answers in Genesis end. Their websites are a little overwhelmed because every church that is doing Answers in Genesis is getting ready for VBS. So if the QR code doesn't work, um, just keep trying. They are working on it on their end. You can also go to our church's website, fifthavenuechristian.com. There will be a little logo that has the Great Jungle Journey, and you can click on that. Same thing, sign up there. If you're a little more low-tech, old school, out at the check-in desk with Harvey, there are some pieces of paper. Please grab one of those, fill that out. Let us know how you would like to help us, and we would love to have you there. It's a great week. Um, and let me tell you, um, on Friday, at Fridays at FECC, Kim Kafton was teaching, and she had some friends share about some miracles. Um, Steph and Jess and I talk about it a lot, that there are no coincidences. We've been trying to figure out um, the right Sunday to make our VBS promo announcement, run the video, not interfere with all the other things that are happening in church, and so this is the Sunday that it wound up. And it, there is no coincidence that our verses were talking about the little ones. So please come help us at VBS. We'd love to have you. Thanks so much. There definitely are no coincidences that that is the Sunday that we do that on that announcement. Divine value, the value of one. That was That is the takeaway for me today, that uh, if you're sitting here today in your seat, that's you, you have value, the value of one. And we are grateful that you're here, and um, we want you to leave knowing that you're loved and that you are valued by the one who created you. If you are a visitor with us today, we have a white insert. Uh, that you can sure fill out. We would love to get to know you better. You can drop it at the back or at the information desk. We have a gift for you. And also, there on the other side, there is a spot for prayer requests that you sure can fill out as well. The bright green insert that's on the back of the notes that we took today, uh, there is a section here that the questions are really about my rights versus the weaker brother. And we would encourage you to dig into that this week. Uh, there are questions that should have arisen from today's message that these verses will help clarify. Finally, chili cook-off. I know you guys were waiting for this. We raised $608 for the Fridays at Fifth Avenue food. So great job for voting with your dollar bills, fives, tens, hundreds, whatever you brought. Thank you for donating. And we had a new winner this year. Is Charlie here? He's not here this service. Charlie ended up beating out Joe, and so uh, great job to everyone who brought chilies. Thank you for that. Tonight, there is no high school youth group because our middle school youth, uh, 10, are on a trip to Pine Haven for a service uh, work event, and so you can be praying for them as they return today that uh, they've made it there safely. It sounds like they had a good work trip, and so now we just want them to be home safely as well, and so we're praying that they're hearts were uh, focused on the Lord and that the service that they were able to provide blessed Pine Haven. Tuesday night, 
College night is on, and I just want to say thank you to the college students who come uh, and the young adults who come to the services. You bring a youth, a youthfulness and a fun that this old guy often is without. And so thank you for showing up on the Sundays, filling this area. If you don't come second service, you should come sometime and just see uh, the youth that show up here uh, second service. It is a blessing to see. It might be down this week because it is spring break. And so uh, they a lot of traveling going on. So prayer mercies for them uh, this week. Middle school youth group is on for Wednesday. And then now for a few larger ones, uh, focus on the Family Marriage Conference this weekend, 15th and 16th, uh, up at the Alliance Church. Uh, we spoke about this, that marriage is important to the family, obviously, is what we believe. And we want to encourage you uh, to visit and to attend the Focus on the Family. Terrence and Jeanette Williams are the speakers that are coming in uh, from the state of Michigan, and they will be the speakers uh, up there. Uh, if you're worried that you might not know someone, my wife and I are registered. And so we will be there. And so if you come, you will know us. And we will look for you. Because we don't want to be the only ones from Fifth Avenue there. So please sign up. There's a registration for uh, of the 11th. There's a QR code. There's a sheet of paper like this on the back table. Grab one as you go out. Please register. Also on the 16th, we're simulcasting the Governor's Prayer Breakfast. There's another sheet out there. Feel free to attend that. That's here in the sanctuary on the 16th. Finally, there is a Senior Saints Fun Fact Day and Desserts this Friday. If you're wondering what a Senior Saint is, I mean, it's defined on my sheet right here that they gave me. 60 and over. If you are 59 and a half, you don't make the cut. But you can come anyways and don't tell anyone. All right, that's the 15th, uh, 1.30 p.m. here at the church uh, in the fellowship hall right out here. And then if you look in your if you look in your worship folder, there are some announcements I have not covered. There are things coming up several weeks from now. Please take a read through. And uh, we're going to close in prayer and be dismissed. But thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with us your presence to encourage us as a whole, as a family of God. Thank you, guys. And let's pray. And then are you going to play us out? He's going to play us out. So here we go. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessing of being able to gather together as your family. Thank you for the encouragement that it brings to us. And thank you for the message today. God, you desire us to grow in you, to richen our walk with you that expands beyond just belief but turns into action. God, I pray that you would continue to use your spirit to move us, to embolden us, and God, to live a life that pleases you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.